thank you everyone for joining uh, joining us today for Kitchener Waterloo Video Tech Meetup. Uh, today uh, we have uh, Jatin Stapra, who's a research scientist at IMAX, and uh, there's a, a, a lot of talk uh, that we've been or I, IMAX has been generating with respect to film grade synthesis. Um, so Jatin's here to to talk about preserving cinematic authenticity, evaluating AV1 film grain synthesis. So uh, go ahead, take it away. Okay, thank you so much, Christopher. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Jatin Sapra, and I'm part of IMAX Research Team. Uh, today I'm going to present you uh, on the topic or on the work which I did in collaboration with my two other colleagues, Kai Zhang and Hojit. Uh, on a subjective study uh, for the preservation of uh, film grain. Um, and in that subjective study, uh, we basically evaluated uh, AV1 film grain synthesis. I'm sorry, I forgot to share my screen. Just a second. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Yes. OK. Yep. Uh, yeah. So uh, the very first thing uh, I want to talk today about is uh, that creative intent matters to filmmakers. Uh, if I want to summarize uh, my whole talk in one statement, uh, that would be this statement, that creative intent matters to filmmakers. We all know that filmmakers are artists, and they they uh, they want their audiences to consume uh, the content in the way they intend to. So, all the films which they create, it's it's their art, and they want uh, people to see their masterpiece. This is the reason. Uh, for example, Christopher Nolan, uh, a very celebrated filmmaker and director. Uh, he called upon audiences to watch uh, his uh, recent movie Oppenheimer to watch in uh, 70 mm film format uh, and with uh, in theaters which has film projectors. And the other thing is that people also want to watch the content uh, in a way their favorite filmmakers uh, intend them to watch. So they listen to content creators. Uh, this is a snapshot. Uh, which was higher, uh, that I had earned seventeen million dollars just from thirty screens, uh, which had film projectors because people really love to watch uh, Oppenheimer uh, in that uh, seventy mm film projector format. Before I jump into the details about uh, what we did in our subjective study and what we observed, and uh, details about the framework, uh, which is called fin grain synthesis framework, uh, I want to show you two uh, frames uh, to just give you an idea about what we are talking about. So the frame which you are seeing on uh, your screen uh, was captured by IMAX film camera. I think I'm not sure if you can see what I'm seeing on my screen because it is de delivered through Google Meets. But if you can observe that there is a grainy texture in the whole frame, uh, especially in the sky background. And the second frame which I want to show is uh, the similar frame uh, or the similar scene which was captured by Sony when it's to digital camera. So if I go back and forth, uh, you may notice that uh, in the frame which was captured by the film camera, there is a random uh, texture, uh, right, which is giving it a, a organic different look as compared to the frame which was captured by uh, Sony to Venice digital camera. So uh, coming back to the point that uh, film green matters to the content creators, uh, one of the important element uh, in, the, in the content uh, is uh, film grain uh, it, and the preservation of uh, it, the creative intent of that film grain uh, in the video delivery pipeline uh, is very very important uh, now like we all know uh, film grain uh, is presented or 
in a way uh, the the cinema cinematographers uh, intend people to watch in the in the cinema screens but how do we uh, you know deliver the same creative intent in the home screen screens using streaming so that is the bigger question now you may wonder like okay uh, we all the time watch all the videos sometimes even in the best quality possible uh, on our uh, streaming platforms then what's the big deal with the content which has film grain the fundamental problem uh, in delivering the content with the film grain is that uh, random uh, texture it has because of the presence of uh, a lot of randomness uh, in a content with film grain uh, it has high entropy and uh, our encoders don't like that much because they are not able to uh, you know uh, leverage that those redundancies which are there in the clean content as compared to the content with the grain texture so uh, because of this reason uh, it's difficult to uh, deliver the content which has grain uh, in a limited bandwidth fashion uh, on our home screens now uh, but there is a good news uh, in the modern codex uh, like av1 uh, there is uh, there is a very elegant framework which was proposed uh, which is called film grain synthesis now to uh, briefly tell you about that framework uh, like in the normal delivery pipeline uh, we have a source content then we encode it uh, it is being uh, streamed uh, uh, through bitstream and then it is decoded on the device side but in the new frame proposed framework uh, which is uh, mostly suitable for the content with grain is that we first denoise the content on before we encode it and while we uh, denoise the content we also measure some kind of scene statistics uh, to to represent that grainy texture then uh, we stream uh, that content uh, after encoding that denoise content after encoding along with uh, along with those uh, statistics which we measured in the film grain estimation module uh, using metadata on the decoder side uh, we decode the denoise content which was seen and then using uh, a film grain synthesizing module uh, we add back that grain uh, with the help of the metadata uh, parameters which we received so th this is uh, the 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 very elegant framework uh, but there are two things in that uh, even though this framework is very elegant uh, the first thing is that like we were not able to find any official study uh, which uh, evaluates uh, this framework with regard to the preservation of creative intent there was no data set or no study which is published which talks about like whether this framework is actually able to preserve the creative intent which filmmakers want to deliver or not and and the thing is that if uh, we are not able to preserve uh, the creative intent using this uh, elegant framework uh, then the adoption will be the concern because filmmakers will not let this framework to be adopted because it's not preserving what they want to deliver uh, the second thing uh, about this is that we found that we we don't have any good measure to uh, you know compare uh, what we have resynthesized on the decoder side versus what what was there in the source. Like as as I mentioned, uh, what's happening is uh, we are first removing the grain and then adding back that grain based on some statistics but there is no surety uh, and that that added back grain is same or similar to what was there in the original content and there is no good way to measure that uh, there is no existing good way to measure that so with that thing in my in our mind uh, we decided to do subjective study so uh, there were two main goals uh, which uh, we this, uh, for which we did the subjective study one was like as i mentioned we want we wanted to understand the potentials of the existing film grain synthesis framework uh, and also wanted to identify if there are any gaps uh, in the film grain synthesis uh, framework 
in the existing framework. The second thing uh, for for uh, for the creation of that film grain metric, uh, we wanted to build uh, a data set uh, which will because to create any subject uh, any objective metric, we first need to have the uh, you know ground truths uh, so that once we we develop any uh, once we create any metric so that we can compare how. Uh, how those objective scores correlate with the subjective ground truths. So we wanted to gather those subjective uh, uh, scores, ground truth. Um, and that was the second goal uh, to, conduct, to conduct our subjective study. Uh, before I go into the details and the observations which we had from this subjective study, I just wanted to highlight that uh, this subjective study was a bit different from the typical uh, VQA subjective study uh, or video quality assessment subjective study we have. Uh, the first reason is that uh, in this subjective study, we are very much focused on the preservation of the creative intent. So because of that, we or, or the subjects need to step into the shoes of the content creators. Uh, in, in a way, they should also be very much familiar with the film grain or the content with film grain, and they should be expert viewers. The second, uh, other, uh, the other thing which was different uh, in this subjective study was like we allowed the subjects to, uh, we gave them the freedom to go as close as possible to the screen if they want to. Like we fixed the distance uh, where they were sitting while doing the subjective study, but we also gave them the permission if they want to go near to the screen to have a look and feel of the content they could go because that's the way uh, creatives evaluate uh, the content on screens. And the other thing was uh, users uh, were allowed to watch the content as many times as possible, which is not very typical in the normal subjective study. So these aspects made uh, this particular subjective study uh, a bit challenging. Uh, just to give you uh, again the overview of the film grain uh, synthesis framework, which I just talked about. So we we have a source content uh, rather than directly encoding and uh, delivering it to the decoder and then delivering it to the eyes. Uh, we first denoise the content on the source side and then we pass it to the encoder. Uh, and also, uh, we pass the denoised and the source content to the green estimation module to come up uh, with some kind of statistical parameters, which we may use on the decoder size uh, side or green generation side to, to regenerate that green. So this is how the typical uh, uh, framework looks like. Uh, in, in, in our subjective study, like to create uh, different test sequences, uh, we followed two approaches. Uh, the first one was because we wanted to study the existing framework, uh, we took the implementation of AV1 film grain synthesis framework uh, from SVT AV1 implementation. And we created test sequences from nine or uh, nine source sequences uh, using that uh, existing framework. So this, this was because we wanted to have some kind of baseline. And the second approach which we took was we want, we also wanted to study like individual components of this framework, like the, the denoising module, uh, the, the, the compression part in the encoder module or or different uh, green parameters. So what we did was we we created different uh, test sequences by choosing, for example, different denoising algorithms. So uh, in in our subjective study, we chose three others apart from SVT AV1 implementation. The first one was BM3D algorithm. This is a very popular uh, denoising algorithm. The other two. Uh, uh, algorithms which we chose were DMR. Uh, DMR stands for Digital Media Remastering. Uh, it's a proprietary uh, it's a proprietary IMAX uh, tool to degrain the content. Uh, and we also chose different compression levels. Uh, like we mean we actually chose three compression levels. One was like losslessly compressed. The second was medium compression level and the third was high compression level. And in 
in terms of regraining regraining parameters we we chose three set of regraining parameters uh, which uh, which which were like which delivered uh, the similar look and feel or or the we chose the other regraining parameter which gave more uh, dense or more intense uh, level of green and the third regraining parameter was which gave less intense or, or less amount of green as compared to the source so with these all these variations we we had around 273 uh, test sequences and uh, each sequence was five seconds each and uh, and I'll talk about like how long the study uh, in the next time, uh, slide maybe. Yeah. So yeah, uh, we 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 had two seventy three test sequences. So we had because there there are there were so many sequences. Uh, we splitted the study into different sessions. Like we conducted four sessions to uh, gather the scores for the whole data set. Uh, to talk about the methodology which we uh, used. To conduct this subjective study, uh, first of all, we used dark viewing environment, uh, and the the TV which we used was LG C2 65 inch 4K OLED TV, and the TV was calibrated for HDR. We disabled all the advanced processing options, uh, like uh, we didn't show, and there was no progress bar which which automatically comes up uh, generally when we watch video on the TV. We disabled that. Uh, the approach which we used was double stimulus impairment scale uh, method. So in this, uh, what we generally do is we show the first the source sequence uh, for five seconds. Then there is a blank screen for a few seconds. And then we show the test sequence. And after that, we ask the subjects to uh, rate the film grain similarity between the test and the source on a scale of 1 to 10. So this was the scale which we used, uh, where 1 means the, the source content and the test content are totally different, and 10 means they are exactly the same, uh, and everything in between. Uh, we, we gathered the data from 17 uh, uh, human subjects uh, internally, uh, which, which were from IMAX. Okay, so after gathering uh, the subjective data uh, from all, all of these subjects, uh, firstly, like uh, we did the pre-processing as per standard BT500-13 uh, to identify if there are any outliers. Uh, so we removed those outliers. So after pre-processing and cleaning the, the gathered data, uh, one thing which we were worried about was like whether uh, different subjects agree with each other or not. So how do we measure that? So one way to measure that is like uh, we calculated uh, SRCC, which is Pierman Rank Order Correlation Coefficient, and PLCC, which is Pier, uh, Pierman Linear uh, Correlation Coefficient between each subject score versus the mean of all other subject scores. So this gives us the sense like whether the scores given by one subject, uh, whether that those scores agree or correlate well with other subjects or not. So doing so, uh, we were uh, happy to see that uh, there was a good agreement among subjects. And on an average, uh, they, the correlation was like 0 0.75 and 0 0.7 for both SRCC and uh, PLCC. Then after pre-processing and, uh, sorry, uh, Chris, you have a question? Yeah, I, I have a couple of questions. Um, mm -hmm. do, did you, um, considering this was kind of, the, a lot of this was kind of targeted for viewing like film grain at home, right? Like not necessarily mm -hmm. in a theater is, is more, do you think the dark room is, like having a dark viewing environment is kind of representative of um, how like most people would watch that content at home? Or is, is that just how you control the experiment? But like, I guess, how, um, how would you find those, the, your findings and, and relate them to like how you would view them 
just normally? So, so I think, uh, yeah, that's a really good question. I think the primary reason like why we decided to go with the dark room was this is uh, because uh, the creatives, when they evaluate the content, they, they typically watch in dark room. So we wanted to imitate that. OK, yeah, sounds good. Thank you. OK. OK. Uh, and then, uh, OK, so I go to the next slide. OK, now coming on to the observations uh, which uh, we had from this subjective study, uh, uh, one of the most important observation uh, which we had from this study was that uh, the, the baseline framework uh, or the SVT the AB1 implementation uh, doesn't consistently preserve the intended film gain. Uh, in most of the cases, expert viewers often rate uh, in favor of the second approach, uh, which is not the SVT AB1 film gain synthesis approach. Uh, so th this was, uh, again, one of the original goals of our subjective study, right, uh, to uh, evaluate the potential of the existing framework. And when, when we tried to dig into like why this is the case, uh, we also interviewed subjects. Uh, and two main things which came out of those interviews were these. The first thing was uh, subjects uh, uh, saw like annoying green patterns, uh, which were periodic uh, in the content, which, which was generated using SVT AV1 uh, pipeline. And the second uh, observation was uh, there was increased bl blurriness uh, like and the loss of detail uh, in the content, uh, which was uh, processed using SVT AV1 denoiser. And perhaps, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if I mentioned it earlier, uh, SVT AV1 uses a uh, Wiener filter. And to our understanding, it is pretty uh, harsh Wiener filter. and it, leads to loss of details and blurriness. So if you see this uh, figure on my screen, uh, I have uh, put two snapshots from two contents. In the first column, uh, this is how the source uh, looks like and which is what we are intending to deliver it to the viewers after processing through this pipeline. Uh, this, the second column shows what we got when we processed it using SVT AV1 framework. And the third uh, shows uh, what we were able to get using a uh, modified framework, like where in which we, we chose different denoiser and, and different uh, film grain parameters. So, as you can clearly see, there is a lot of loss of detail and blurriness in the content, which is from AV1 framework. The, the second observation which I mentioned was the presence of the periodic pattern uh, in the content, which was uh, resynthesized using AV1 framework. I'm not sure how it is coming out on your screen. Like if you compare the source the look and feel of the source content from these three snapshots from three different frames uh, and look and feel of the re-synthesized uh, or the synthesized screen, uh, you can clearly see there are like periodic patterns uh, uh, which which are against uh, what what creatives want because they, they want that organic and the random uh, randomness of the film grain to be preserved. So this is this was the other reason why um, our expert viewers gave less score uh, to the content which came from the AV1 uh, SVT AV1 pipeline. Moving on to the other observation, uh, the other thing which we wanted to study was like the interplay between different uh, components of the framework. Uh, the first thing uh, which we studied was, okay, what's the impact of compression level? So to do, uh, to, to study that, what we did was, uh, we plotted two curves, uh, the uh, two uh, graphs or charts. Uh, the one on the left side uh, is for the content, uh, which was losslessly compressed. And one on the left, uh, on the right side, is for the content uh, which was uh, compressed heavily. On the y-axis is the mean opinion score, uh, which is a subjective score, average of the subjective score from all the subjects for 
and on the x axis we have uh, nine different contents which we used in in this subjective study the very first observation uh, which we have from here is that okay uh, for the content which was losslessly compressed uh, for many or most of the content types uh, the 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 synthesized uh, you know uh, the synthesized frames uh, or the synthesized uh, content got pretty good scores they are like around eight if we look at the scale again uh, eight means uh, very similar to uh, what is there in the source but so which means like uh, maybe uh, uh, this this framework or this idea works uh, like the synthesis works except a couple of contents uh, like source 9 and source 10 uh, we were not able to do good job in terms of synthesis but in other cases it was good but when we do the compression uh, we see a significant drop in the score uh, from like 8 8.5 to 4 5 uh, and also the the arrows which you see uh, along each door uh, reflects the confidence uh, level from the subject to rate to give that particular score and and the confidence decreases uh, when the compression level uh, increases uh, so one of the one of the inference which we can draw from here is that uh, film grain uh, like people are not able to evaluate uh, film grain or they don't like the synthesis of film grain if the compression level is high uh, this can be an important observation uh, to streamers because they may not need to uh, implement this idea of film grain synthesis for all the runs in the ABR ladder maybe they just need to care about the top profiles uh, they mean they they may ignore the lower profiles in the ladder because people don't care much about film grain uh, when the compression level is high actually this was also like uh, told quite often in our interviews with the subjects that they were like when the compression was high we were not able to like compare the grain uh, the look and feel was very different and secondly the other compression artifacts uh, were more annoying and they just forgot about the preservation of grain. The next thing which we wanted to study was what, what is the impact of the denoising module. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, we, we had the content uh, from our baseline implementation that was SVT AV1, which was using Wiener filter uh, for denoising. And then there were three variations which we introduced uh, were like two uh, DMR configurations and the and the BM3D. So this is a plot which uh, shows the mean opinion scores for uh, different contents uh, when we are just fixing the uh, compression level to losslessly compressed, and we are fixing the uh, green parameters uh, so that we can have the fair comparison between different denoisers. So, as you can see here, uh, the lowest score is given to uh, the SVT AV1 denoiser or BM3D, uh, which, which we also observed in our previous slides when we saw like there was uh, blurriness and loss of details because of these denoisers. And on the other side, when we uh, when we chose DMR, uh, uh, IMAX uh, proprietary degraining algorithm, uh, both of them performed uh, significantly better uh, in terms of average mean opinion score uh, for most of the contents or across all the contents. So this clearly says that uh, the denoiser is very, very important in this whole framework. It's not like uh, we just do a good job in terms of film grain parameters estimation and then uh, doing a good job in synthesizing back the film grain. The denoising part is also very, very important to preserve that final look and uh, feel of the uh, synthesized uh, con uh, grainy content. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, like the second goal of our subjective study is to, uh, you know, gather data uh, to come up with uh, a, a quality metric which 
uh, which can measure the uh, the difference between film grain. But before we do that, we wanted to evaluate the performance of existing quality metrics. Uh, as you can see, like uh, none of the commonly or the popular uh, commonly used or the popular quality metrics perform well on on this data set. Uh, the correlation of these objective metrics uh, is not very good uh, with the mean opinion scores which we got from this study. This for, this is this was actually uh, expected because the existing quality metrics or the commonly used quality metrics uh, they they work on a on a principle of measuring some kind of distance between pixels or a group of pixels. But whereas uh, when we look at the film grain, uh, we, our human visual system processes that film grain uh, in, in a general sense or a holistic point of view. Uh, and that is missing in, in the design of uh, existing uh, quality metrics. Uh, in conclusions, uh, I can again say that, OK, film grain is one of the most important components of the creative intents. Uh, they, they, the creatives, they love to uh, preserve and they love their audiences to watch what they intend them to watch and film grain is uh, one of the most important from of component of that uh, the second is that encoders are not capable of compressing film grain uh, because there is not any meaningful redundancy therefore this idea of film grain synthesis is very smart and it's absolutely necessary for the industry to support that uh, content creators and filmmakers uh, adore this film grain and so the look and feel of the synthesized film grain has a significant impact on their perception of this approach. And we believe that if uh, industry, uh, if uh, co content creators are satisfied uh, with the, you know, uh, perception of the regrained content, uh, then only they'll lead to the uh, adoption of this framework. Uh, the next one is that existing approaches for the film grain uh, synthesis are suboptimal. Uh, as we saw, like uh, each module uh, has its own role, be it denoising, be it compression, be it the selection of parameters. Uh, so therefore, uh, like to derive uh, these modules uh, in a better way, or uh, we need to have uh, this problem looked at from the perceptual quality perspective and without inventing a film grain similarity metric uh, finding the optimum solution in the film grain synthesis search space is quite challenging if not possible uh, i would like to end uh, my presentation uh, with with a quote again from christopher nolan uh, to again highlight the importance of film grain uh, which creatives have uh, it's so he says, it's about the moving image. It's about the cinematic sto storytelling. And the greatest movies made could only be films. Uh, with that, I end my presentations. Please uh, let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Yeah, Jesse. Hi, um, sorry, I'm on my phone. So hopefully you can hear me OK. Yeah. Again. Uh, yeah, I was curious about kind of the, the nature of the sources. Like you mentioned that, you know, it doesn't do well at high compression. Were all the sources uh, like high def and ultra high def, like 4K? I'm curious, like, how this would apply to older films, either standard definition classic films or even just older kind of high definition films, uh, if it can preserve kind of film grain, if we re-encoded those. You know, with AV1 and the IMAX uh, film grain synthesis, and how it kind of works on like upscaling. If we're upscaling, you know, standard definition or high def to like a 4K screen, if, if the film grain synthesis and the denoiser has kind of an impact there. Mm -hmm. So, so okay. So the the sources which we used in this subjective study were all like USD content, uh, or you can say it 4K. We didn't use uh, HD or full HD. Okay. So yeah. there's no idea really if like if we 
kind of re-encoded some like classic films to try to re represerve sort of the intent there, whether or not that would how 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 that would work then this would really be for kind of new films going forward. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Brendan? Uh, can you hear me fine? Yes, I can. Th thanks for the presentation. It's really interesting. So um, just got a question. So you mentioned in your slides that you have an alternative method um, as uh, instead of the SVT AV1 um, film grain synthesis. So uh, does it also solve the, the problem you mentioned regarding the pattern grain issue that you saw with SVTAV1? Uh, yes, it did. And then so, uh, is, is it still yeah. based on the SVTAV1 framework, and but you just updated your uh, customized uh, degraining filter as well as your the way to generate those parameters, or is it uh, completely something else? No, like we, uh, in terms of like, Principally, uh, it, it was same as SVT AV1, uh, but we uh, to like to manually tweak the film grain parameters and all other things. We actually used uh, an open source tool from Interdigital. I'm not sure if if that answers your question. Okay, I I see. So it's pretty much we are still using SVT AV1 uh, with their framework, but just update the way we generate those film grain parameters yeah that's correct right okay thanks so the framework is same yeah and dave yeah uh it seems to me that for this to work um you need a grain estimator that can swallow a rather large range of grain. That, that's, I think someone was getting to that with an earlier question about, you know, are grain from 50 year old movies compared to grain from very recent electronic cameras, which have a quite a different character. So that means that the bitstream between the encoder and the decoder has to encode all of the possible amplitudes and frequency spectra of grain that you're likely to encounter. How many parameters do you think are, like how many numbers, how many degrees of freedom are there necessary to describe grain in a general enough way? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if I followed your question. Like you're asking like how many uh, degrees of freedom are there in the uh, parameters? To yeah, how, how many numbers, um, more or less, does it take to fully describe all of the different kinds of grain that you might see in various sources such that you can reconstruct them at the far end? Um, and you can't send the grain itself, so you have to send some mathematical description of the statistics of the grain. But I, I'm just sort of wondering if anyone has an idea of how, uh, how how many dimensions that space has, right? I mean, obviously there's amplitude versus frequency, but it's not just that, right? The, the, grains have very different looks from each other. Yeah. So, uh, so okay. Uh, yeah. So in in the AV1 framework, uh, there are two like popular approaches for film grain generation. One is uh, uh, auto regression model and the second is frequency filtering so in this subjective study we used the auto regression model and in that uh, i think like uh, we, i'm not sure what was the lag value which we used so there were seven or eight parameters uh, for that particular model okay so this, this is something that we need to, to um standardize on at some point right you can't have each encoder come up with a new set of parameters that all decoders that are expected to decode so we need to standardize on some way of actually describing the grain yeah so like there are two points uh, uh david um, standard bodies they are ac actively working on them and i think the okay yeah you know, they all agree that this this auto regression and frequency cutoff they they can somehow simulate the, the grain but i know that there are limitations into it uh, i would say that uh, if you look at the even um 
the statistics, and, and Jatin, if you show uh, slide number 14, so you see that uh, even for our subjective study, uh, there are a couple of uh, source files, like source 9 or source 10 or so. When you look at the, 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 the even the low compression part of it, uh, or low compression version of it, you still see that people, they don't um, believe that the, 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 um, the, the synthesized grain looks and like looks the same as the source or the, the grain in the source. So um, there, there are still limitations, even in auto regression frequency cutoff, but the goal of the standard is to cover the, like the, the modern kind of grain that you see. Like if you, if you refer to old movies or so, I would say that there is a limitation in both auto regression frequency cutoff to simulate the old look and feel of the grain. Back to your comment about the, uh, the typical parameters or the typical, um, a degree of freedoms that you see in the uh, synthesized grain using no matter like auto regression or frequency cutoff, um, it's mostly about the density of the grain and the shape and the aspect ratio of the grain. Um, it, you don't have that much freedom in in terms of select or specifying a lot of details regarding the synthesized grain. Um, and this is again there is another limitation of the the uh, synthesized grain that we see in the standards. Uh, but it's, uh, the, the goal is to say that it's, it can be very efficient. It's, it's way better than having nothing in, in, in the streaming platforms. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the alternatives are having nothing and a low bit rate or using a lot of bit rate to transmit the original grain. Yeah, which is, which is not feasible, right? So like, uh, yeah. Streaming companies that like today, people like or streaming companies, uh, the alternative the alternative is either to remove the grain and just uh, uh, encode the the cleaner version of the, the the content and don't care about like the film grain or creative intent. The other uh, approach is to take the source with film grain encode it in a very like in the maximum thing that they can accommodate. Uh, but at the end of the day, you see a lot of distortion. And the and the grain and say that well this is the best that we can do. So I, I would say the film grain synthesis is is a remedy for sure. But like uh, we need to drive the the component of film grain synthesis uh, in a smart way. Um, the current standards they don't think uh, think or they don't. Or let's put it this way: they haven't spent a lot of time to. Um, to come up with a, a, a strategy or better observation or a better kind of a, a sim, uh, estimation of the noise uh, uh, characteristics. Uh, they are mostly trying to uh, convince people to adopt this framework. But again, we, we, we believe that if you if you cannot simulate the grain as much as, as, as close as possible to the source, then people, they may not be into adoption. So they, they may not look into um, you know, adopting this film grain frame, uh, film grain synthesis framework soon. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Hujit. Chris? Um, did you ever go in to see why source, uh, source nine and 10 scored so poorly? Like, was there something sort of, uh, something specific to that kind of content type? Uh, it, it like yeah we actually looked into those two sources uh one peculiar thing uh in those two were like uh, the sources had a lot of grain uh the size uh and the density uh and the shape uh it was a bit different from others so it was like heavy grain content um a separate question uh, how do you think this study would work with lar longer sequences because instead of five seconds to like 30 or 30 second sequences or something like that because uh, like presumably depending on your encoder configuration the amount of compression and whatnot is going to impact it differently the longer your sequences or you can you can do different things when you're encoder when you're encoding longer sequences than shorter sequences. So so when you're talking about longer sequences, you mean like multiple scenes, uh, or like long long sequence but same scene. Either or even. 
so so so, so what what i think uh, we we believe maybe who just correct me if i'm wrong so this uh, film brain synthesis uh, approach will work on a scene by scene basis if not only frame by frame basis so because each scene uh, we have observed has a different look and feel uh, even if we even if we use the same uh, green parameters so it it varies from scene to scene so this approach will work only if we do the this uh, film green parameter selection and synthesis on a scene by scene basis i'm not sure if that answered your question Thank you. It's good. Uh, any other questions? Okay. Well, uh, I want to thank you, Jatin, for presenting, and uh, thank you everyone for for joining. And um, yeah, if you have any other questions, uh, I can forward Jatin's email along, or uh, you can message him on Slack. Uh, but yeah, so thanks everyone for coming. Thank you, everyone. OK, thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. 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 Thanks, Jetty. Thanks.